Okay, so today our, our, we have our last lecture. Um, and let's recall that uh, in the previous lecture, we began to discuss the Borel functional calculus for no normal operators on the Hilbert space. Um, today, our first goal will be uh, to prove the uh, existence of the Borel functional calculus, which was formulated but wasn't proved at the end of the previous lecture. And to prove this result, uh, we need to discuss uh, a useful relation between uh, operators on a Hilbert space and sesquilinear forms. Um, let's recall some notation. Uh, suppose we have two inner product spaces, H1 and H2. Inner product spaces. So at this point, we, we don't assume they are complete. And suppose that T is a linear operator from H1 to H2. Then we define the sesquilinear form Ft associated to T. This is the sesquilinear form on the product of H1 and H2 defined uh, by the following formula. This is the inner product of Tx and Y. Uh, so, um, in general, the operator T is not assumed to be, to be bounded. Uh, so, initial question is, uh, which kind of sesquilinear forms correspond to uh, bounded operators? Uh, we need the following definition. We say that uh, sesquilinear form F on the product of H1 and H2 is bounded if there exists a constant C uh, such that for each X in H1 and Y in H2 the following inequality holds. And by definition, the smallest C satisfying this condition is called the norm of F. The smallest non-negative C satisfying this condition is called the norm of F. Uh, we have the following simple result for position one. First of all, uh, sesquilinear form F is bounded even only if it is continuous. This is uh, quite similar to the uh, corresponding result about linear operators between normal spaces. And second, if we uh, take the set, the space of all bounded sesquilinear forms on the product of H1 and H2, then this is a normed space. So the norm um, defined in the previous, uh, def uh, the previous definition is, uh, is indeed a norm and it makes this space into a normal space. Uh, the proof is a simple exercise. 
so the situation is very similar to the situation with linear operators between normal spaces. And here's a typical example of a bounded sesquilinear form, proposition two. If T is a bounded linear operator from H1 to H2, then the respective sesquilinear form of T is bounded and the norm of, of T equals the norm of T. Well, indeed, um, the, um, first of all, um, if we apply, if we look at the definition of FT, mm, so this is the definition of FT, uh, and apply the cauchy bonikowski schwartz inequality, we immediately get that FT is bounded and that the norm of FT is less than or equal to the norm of T. And to prove uh, the equality here, we take any element in our space x and calculate, calculate the norm of tx squared. So this is the inner product of tx by itself. And by the definition of ft, this is ft applied to x and tx. And uh, this is less than or equal to the norm of ft multiplied by the norm of x and by the norm of tx. And if we now cancel uh, the norm of tx from here and take the supremum over the closed unit ball, we get um, the required equality. The norm of t equals the norm of ft. It turns out that if um, H2 is a Hilbert space, so let's me recall once again that, uh, let me recall once again that uh, at this point, we don't require H1 and H2 to be complete. But if H2 is a Hilbert space, then it turns out that this uh, proposition describes all bounded sesquilinear forms on the product of H1 and H2. So we have the following theorem. Suppose that H1 is an inner product space, not necessarily complete, and H2 is a Hilbert space. Then the map, which acts from the space of bounded operators between H1 and H2, uh, and the space of all bounded sesquilinear forms, on the product h1 h2 so this map takes t to the associated sesquilinear form of t this map is an isometric isomorphism Okay, uh, so why is it so? First of all, we already know from proposition two that this map is uh, an isometry. Uh, so we have to prove the surjectivity of this map. Suppose we have a, a bounded sesquilinear form F 
are the product of H1 and H2. So we have to show that F comes from an operator between H1 and H2. So we do the following. For each element X in H1, we define a uh, linear functional fx on h2 uh, by the following formula fx of y is f of x y so um, and since we want it uh, to be linear we must take the complex conjugation here So we see that fx is a linear functional. fx is linear. And moreover, uh, since um, the sesquilinear form f is bounded, we conclude that uh, fx is bounded and that the norm of fx is uh, less than or equal to the norm of f multiplied by the norm of x. So it is bounded and uh, it is defined on the Hilbert space H2. So we may apply the Ries theorem, which says that each bounded linear functional on the Hilbert space uh, comes from a vector of the space. So there exists a unique vector, which will be denoted by T of X. So it depends of X, of course. This is a vector in H2, such that um, fx of y uh, is the inner product of y and t of x. Or equivalently, this can be written as follows. Uh, f of x, y equals the inner product of tx and y. And here x sits in h1 and y in h2. Uh, so this vector t of x is defined for each uh, little x in h1. Uh, and we obtain a map. Uh, we obtain a map. T from H1 to H2. So it's a simple exercise to show that T is linear. This uh, easily follows from, from this formula. So T is linear and uh, we see that the uh, our form f is nothing but the uh, sesquilinear form associated to t. And finally, finally, we have to show that t is bounded. So why is it bounded? Okay, uh, let's recall that um, the Ries bijection is isometric. So the norm of the vector t of x equals the norm of the respective functional f x f x. But we have already um, estimated the norm of fx here. Uh, so the norm of fx is less than or equal to the norm of f multiplied by the norm of x. And this inequality implies that t is bounded. And this completes the proof. So we have shown that our isometry from the space of bounded operators to the space of bounded sesquilinear forms is subjective. So it is an isometric isomorphism. Okay, so briefly, uh, the essential information contained in this theorem is that uh, each bounded sesquilinear forms uh, comes from an operator. This is very useful.
Okay, so now we are ready to prove the existence of the Borel fun functional calculus. Uh, we have the following theorem. Theorem one. Uh, suppose that X is a compact Hausdorff topological space. And suppose that Pi is a star representation of the algebra of continuous functions on X on a Hilbert space H, star representation. Then there exists a unique continuous star representation by tilde uh, of the algebra of bounded Borel functions on X, B of X, equipped with the weak measure topology To B of H to the algebra of bounded operators on H equipped with the weak operator topology. Such that T pi tilde extends pi. So each star representation of C of X uniquely extends uh, to a star representation of B of X, which is continuous uh, in the indicated topologies. Uh, perhaps it's appropriate to recall uh, the definitions of the weak measure topology and the weak operator topology. So well, let, let's recall the definitions. The weak measure topology on the algebra of bounded Borel functions, B of X, uh, is uh, given uh, by the following family of seminorms. The seminorms are indexed by Radon measures on X and the seminar mu, where mu is a Radon measure, is given by the following formula. So this is the modulus of the integral of F. And the weak operator topology on the algebra of bounded operators on H uh, is the local convex topology generated by. Uh, generated by the following family of seminars. Um, so it will be convenient to denote the vectors in H now by U and V. So little x and little y will be points of our compact space X and U and V are vectors in H and the respective seminar is given by the following formula. Okay, uh, to prove uh, theorem one, we need the following lemma. lemma. Uh, suppose that A and B are locally convex star algebras. Locally convex star algebras, and suppose that B is Hausdorff. Um, and suppose we have a dense uh, star subalgebra A0 in A, a dense star subalgebra. And suppose that phi is a continuous linear map from A to B, continuous linear operator from A to B, such that the restriction of, of 
of phi to a zero is a star homomorphism. I claim that in this case, uh, phi is a star homomorphism. So if a continuous linear map restricted to a dense subalgebra is a star homomorphism, uh, then it is a star homomorphism on, on the algebra. Uh, the proof is a simple exercise. So basically this is general topology. Everything is reduced to the fact that if two continuously, if two continuous maps between topological spaces from an arbitrary topological space to a Hausdorff topological space, if they are the same on a dense subset, then they are the same everywhere. Okay, so let's now prove theorem one. Uh, first of all, the uniqueness, uh, the uniqueness of the extension pi tilde is immediate from the fact that uh, C of X is dense in B of X with respect to the weak measure topology. This fact was proved at the previous lecture and uh, it immediately gives the uniqueness of pi tilde. So let's now prove that such an extension exists. We uh, start with the following construction. We take any pair of uh, vectors, u and v in H, and we define a linear functional f u v on the algebra of uh, continuous functions C of X uh, by the following formula. So we apply pi of F to U and take the inner product with V. Uh, so clearly uh, uh, this, uh, this is a linear functional and uh, the cauchy bunikovsky schwartz inequality basically implies that it is uh, uh, bounded. So the norm of this functional uh, can be estimated as follows. Um, this is less than or equal to the norm of pi multiplied by the norm of u and multiplied by the norm of v. Uh, but since pi is a star representation of C of X, uh, the norm of pi is equal, um, uh, the norm of pi equals one. So we know that each, uh, um, each star homomorphism from a Banach star algebra to a C star algebra has a norm of one. So this is just the norm of U multiplied by the norm of V. Uh, so in particular, we see that uh, in particular, F U V is bounded. So we can apply the Reese Markov Kakutani theorem, which states that such a functional is given by, by a Radon measure. There exists a unique Radon measure, which will be denoted by mu U V. such that um, our functional, that is the inner product of, uh, of f, u, and v, is the integral of f with respect to this measure. And this formula holds for each continuous function f. Well, let it be formula one. Uh, okay, of course, uh, the measure mu uv depends on u and v. 
And it's clear from this formula one that the map which takes uh, each pair u and v to the measure mu u v is sesquilinear. Uh, now, uh, a key observation is that um, the right hand side of Formula One, so this integral, makes sense not only for continuous functions, but also for each bounded Borel function on X. And this enables us to define the following sesquilinear form. We take, each, uh, we take an arbitrary bounded Borel function f on X, and we define we define a sesquilinear form f phi f by the following by the following formula phi f of u v is the integral of f with respect to the measure mu u v. So it's clear from construction that uh, this is a sesquilinear form because the measure m mu uh, uv uh, is linear in u and, uh, and anti-linear in v. So phi f is a sesquilinear form. I claim that this form is bounded. Well, indeed. Uh, if we take the absolute value of this, this is the absolute value of the integral. Uh, it's, uh, and it, it follows from the basic properties of the integral that this is less than or equal to the supremum norm of f multiplied by the variation of mu, that is the norm of mu u v. Um, okay. Um, uh, so what can you say about the norm of mu uv? Um, the uh, Riesmark of Kakutani theorem is an isometric bijection. So this is the norm of mu, the norm of uv equals the norm of the respective functional big F uv. And we have already estimated the norm of this functional as the product of the norm of u and the norm of v. So this chain of inequalities implies that uh, our form phi f is bounded. And by our previous result, we conclude that there exists a unique bound of linear operator, which will be denoted by pi tilde of f. This is a bounded operator on h, such that um, the sesquilinear form associated to pi tilde uh, is precisely our form phi f. That is the integral of f with respect to the measure mu uv. And this holds for each bounded Borel function f on x. Okay, let's denote this as formula two. Uh, now the operator pi tilde of f is defined for each bounded Borel function f. So you obtain a map pi tilde, which acts from the algebra of Borel functions, bounded Borel functions on x to the algebra of bounded linear operators on h. Uh, it's, uh, it's immediate from formula two that this map is linear. This is a simple exercise. This map is linear. Um, 
And I claim that this map is continuous with respect to the weak measure topology and the weak operator topology. Uh, to prove this, we recall our general continuity criterion between um, continuity criterion for linear operators between locally convex spaces. So to prove the continuity, we must take uh, pi tilde of f and uh, calculate one of the seminorms, which uh, one of the seminorms we generate the weak operator topology. So this seminorm is indexed by two vectors u and v. Uh, well, by the definition of the weak operator topology, this is the absolute value of the inner product or the following inner product. And the formula two uh, implies that, it, that this is the modulus of the integral. But the modulus of the integral is nothing but uh, the seminorm of f corresponding to the measure mu uv. And now our general continuity criterion implies that pi tilde is continuous with respect to the weak measure topology on B of X and the weak operator topology on B of H. Okay, uh, let's now look again at formulas one and two. If we now compare one and two, we see that pi tilde extends pi. So the restriction of pi tilde to C of X is pi. Well, and finally, we know that pi is a star homomorphism. Uh, and now we can apply our lemma to this pi tilde. So pi C of X is a dense subalgebra on B of X. Uh, it is dense with respect to the weak measure topology. So we, we may apply our lemma and we conclude that pi tilde is a star homomorphism. And this completes the proof. Okay, so now we see that Let's look at the statement. Uh, we now see that each uh, star representation of C of X uniquely extends to a continuous star representation of B of X, uh, which is continuous with respect to the weak measure topology and the weak operator topology. And we have already not uh, noticed at the previous lecture that this result uh, contains, as a special case, uh, the existence of the Borel functional calculus. So this is our theorem two, uh, which is uh, our second form of the spectral theorem. If T is a bounded normal operator on the Hilbert space H, and K is a compact subset of the complex plane, uh, which contains the spectrum of T, then there exists a unique Borel functional calculus for T on K. Uh, well, this is indeed a special case of theorem one. Uh, so to get theorem two, we simply apply theorem one to the continuous functional calculus of T. So the continuous functional calculus is the star representation of the algebra C of K. So we simply extend it to B of K as was shown in theorem one. And what we get is uh, a Borel functional calculus for T on K and that's it. Um, 
Okay. Mm. So our final goal for today is to prove um, another form of the spectral theorem uh, in terms of uh, spectral measures. Uh, first of all, let, let me give some motivation before I give formal definitions. Let's, uh, let's um, uh, look at um, motivation, which comes from, actually, from linear algebra. Uh, suppose that we have a finite dimensional Hilbert space, H. And uh, suppose that T is a normal operator, or for simplicity, we, for, for simplicity, we assume that T is a self-adjoint operator, self-adjoint operator on H. Then the standard result from linear algebra states that T is diagonal, diagonalizable, that is, there exists an orthonormal basis such that the matrix of T in this basis is diagonal. So the fact that T is diagonalizable can be equivalently written in the following form. So T can be written as the following sum. Lambda E lambda, where lambda runs over the spectrum of T so that the sum is finite. Sum is finite, where uh, E lambda is the orthogonal projection onto the respective eigenspace. E lambda is the orthogonal projection onto the eigenspace, that is onto the kernel of T minus lambda. So this formula, uh, this formula here is essentially equivalent uh, to the statement that T is diagonalizable. Okay, let's, let's now look at an infinite dimensional situation. Suppose that H is an arbitrary Hilbert space. H is a Hilbert space. And suppose that T is a self-adjoint compact operator on H. So now the Hilbert Schmidt theorem, the Hilbert Schmidt theorem implies that T can be written in the same, in essentially the same form as before. So it is the following sum over the spectrum. Uh, and the projections e lambda are exactly as before. So they are the orthogonal projections onto the eigenspaces. So in this case, so this sum is not finite in general, but it is at most countable because we know that the spectrum of the compact self adjoint operator, actually of, an a, of any compact operator, is at most countable. So this formula is essentially equivalent to the Hilbert Schmidt. Okay, mm. and finally, we suppose that we have an arbitrary self adjoint bounded, bounded self adjoint operator on Hilbert space H. So T is self adjoint, but is not necessarily compact. Uh, so it's easy to see that um, in general, the previous formula fails for T. Uh, and the reason is very simple. Uh, bounded self-adjoint operators, it can happen that T uh, has no eigenspaces at, at all. And so the right-hand side of this formula is, is zero. 
for the formula failings. Uh, our goal will be to, roughly, roughly, our goal will be to show that we can save this formula. Uh, if we replace the sum in this formula by an integral. Uh, now, of course, um, um, the um, expression e, e of lambda here, so this, these operators E of lambda are not the orthogonal projections onto the eigenspaces. So this is something different. Uh, so our goal will be to, um, to give a precise meaning to this formula. In particular, to explain what um, E of lambda is and to prove this formula. And this will be our third form of the spectral theorem. Okay. Mm. Now we uh, suppose that we have a Hilbert space. We suppose that H is a Hilbert space. And let's consider the set of all orthogonal projections on H. So PR of H is the set of all the orthogonal projections on H. Uh, by definition, if we have two orthogonal projections being P and Q, we say that they are orthogonal to each other. If their images are orthogonal. We have the following simple result about orthogonal projections. This is proposition one. Uh, two projections P and Q are orthogonal, even only if the, their product is zero, PQ is zero, uh, which happens even only if QP is zero. And equivalently, this means that their sum, P plus Q, is an orthogonal projection. Uh, the proof is simple and useful exercise for you. And we need one more result on orthogonal projections. This is our proposition two. Sorry, uh, uh, a short break. <clears throat> okay, so um, our next result about orthogonal projections is the following proposition. Uh, suppose that we have finitely many orthogonal projections, P1 to Pn. P1 to Pn are non-zero orthogonal projections. And uh, lambda 1 to lambda n are just complex numbers. Uh, then I claim that uh, the norm of the linear combination of these projections is just the maximum of the absolute values of these numbers. And again, this is a simple exercise. which is a simple application of the Pythagorean theorem. Okay, now we're ready to define uh, spectral measures. Uh, 
Uh, suppose that X is any set, and suppose that script A is uh, sigma algebra of uh, subsets of X. Sigma algebra. By definition, a map E from A to the set of projections on H is a finitely additive spectral measure. Finitely additive spectral measure on A. If it satisfies the following conditions. First of all, it is finitely additive in the usual sense. That is, if you have two, well, actually, uh, finitely many, finitely many disjoint uh, sets in R sigma algebra. Then the measure of their union is the sum of their measures. Well, the usual finite additivity property is similar to the finite additivity of um, usual measures. Uh, property two e is normalized in the sense that the that e of x is the identity operator. And finally, property three is the following multiplicativity property. If you have two sets a and b, then the measure of their intersection is the product of their measures. By the way, a nice exercise is to show that actually uh, property three follows from the finite additivity. But, but well, this is not very essential for us. So property three will be, will be the axiom. Um, okay, so this is the definition of a finitely additive spectral measure. Uh, let's make a simple observation. Let's observe that first of all, if E is a finitely additive spectral measure, then uh, the measure of the empty set is a zero operator. This easily follows from property one. And second, um, if we have two disjoint sets A and B, then property three implies that the respective projections are orthogonal because their product is zero. Okay, now if we have an arbitrary spectral measure E, uh, we can define a family of complex measures uh, by the following formula. So let's introduce some notation. If U and V are vectors in our Hilbert space H, uh, we define complex measure E U V on A uh, by the following formula. This will be the inner product of EOA applied to you with V. So it's immediate from, from this formula that EUV is a complex measure, a finitely additive complex measure. Uh, we have the following result. This is proposition three. Uh, the variation of this measure is finite. The variation is finite and can be estimated as follows. Oh, 
Uh, okay, so to prove this result, uh, we just use the definition of the variation. So we take any uh, decomposition of x into finite domain disjoint subsets a1 to an. And we try to estimate uh, the following sum. So let's recall that by definition, the supremum of, of all such sums, supremum is taken is over all such decompositions, is um, the left-hand side of our inequality. So this is the variation of x. Uh, so we can write this in the following way. We introduce suitable complex numbers lambda i, uh, and we here I also um, use the definition of our measure E v, and to introduce uh, suitable uh, complex numbers lambda i uh, such that the absolute value of each lambda i is one. So it's clear that such numbers exist. We simply uh, so each complex number multiplied by suitable lambda is equal, becomes equal to, it, to, to its absolute value. Um, okay, now by linearity, we can write this in the following way. And now the kashubinikovsky schwarz inequality implies that this is less than or equal to the norm of the respective linear combination. Multiplied by the norm of u and multiplied by the norm of v. Uh, if we now recall our proposition two, so we know that all the projections E of A i are orthogonal to each other uh, because the sets are disjoint. So the sets A i are disjoint. So the respective projections are orthogonal. And by proposition two, this operator, the norm of this operator is uh, equal, is less than or equal to the maximum, ma maximum of, of the lambda i's. But this is but this is one. This is less than or equal to one by proposition two. So and as a result, we see that this is less than or equal to the norm of u multiplied by the norm of v. And this completes the proof. So as a result, we see that each finitely additive spectral measure generates a family of finitely additive complex measures by this formula. Um, here's a couple of examples of spectral measures. Example one. Uh, Suppose that X, A, and U is a measure of space. Measure of space. And let H be the respective L2 space. Uh, and for each uh, set in our sigma algebra, we define the projection E of A to be the multiplication operator by the characteristic function of A. So chi a is the characteristic function of the set a, which is one if x is an a and zero elsewhere. So it's, it's easy to see that uh, e is indeed a spectral measure. Uh, this example can be generalized as follows. Example two. Uh, suppose that uh, 
x is any set and a is a sigma algebra of subsets of x. And let b a of x denote the algebra of bounded a measurable functions on x. So he measurable means that the preimage of each Borel set sits in the sigma algebra A. And suppose that we have a, a star representation pi of this algebra on the Hilbert space H. Um, so we observe that this representation generates a spectral measure E pi on A by the following formula. E pi of A is pi applied to, to the characteristic function chi A. And again, it's very easy to see that uh, this function e pi is a spectral measure. So this is a generalization of example one, because if, um, uh, well, h is the L2 space on x a mu, and the pi of, um, pi of f is the multiplication operator, then example one becomes a special case of example two. It turns out that example two actually describes all spectral measures on A. So we have the following result. Mm. Theorem. Well, that is the theorem one. This is the first theorem in the section on spectral measures. Suppose that as before, uh, X is a set. A is a sigma algebra of subsets of X. And E is a finitely additive spectral measure on A. Then there exists a unique star representation, which will be denoted by IE or the algebra of bounded A measurable functions on X of the Hilbert space H such that for each set A in our sigma algebra, um, E of A is our representation applied to the characteristic function of A. And moreover, in this case, uh, for each function f, for each bound measurable function f, um, the following formula holds if we take our operator i of f, then the associated sesquilinear form is given by the following formula. This is the integral of f with respect to the complex measure EUV. By the way, uh, the right hand side of this equality is well defined because uh, the, well, we know that this measure is um, its finite variation and each bounded measurable function can be integrated with respect to a finite additive measure of finite variation. 
And before we prove this theorem, let's introduce the respective terminology for each bounded Borel, sorry, for each bounded measurable function f, the respective operator i e of f is denoted in this way, and it's called the integral, the integral of f with respect to the spectral measure e. Um, the proof of theorem one involves a construction which is very similar to the construction of the usual Lebesgue integral for bounded measurable functions. Uh, to prove this result, we first define our integral on simple functions. So we denote by S A of X, the linear span of all the characteristic functions. So this is the space of simple functions. And we observe that this space, this is a dense star subalgebra. Dense star subalgebra of the algebra of bounded measurable functions. And since it is dense, uh, we immediately see that if such a representation IE exists, then it is unique. It implies the uniqueness of IE. Oh, because IE is already defined on characteristic functions, so by linearity it uniquely extends to uh, if it extends to a simple function, then the extension is unique. And uh, simple functions are dense in, uh, in bounded measurable functions. And uh, we have also to recall that each star representation is automatically continuous. So the continuous extension is unique. Uh, okay, let's now show that such an ex extension actually exists. Well, we uh, try to define the integral of a simple function in the usual way. Each uh, simple function f can be written in the following form. This is a linear com combination of characteristic functions of measurable sets. And the sets ai can be chosen in such a way that they are disjoint. And now we define the integral of f with respect to e in the only possible way, namely by the following formula. Uh, it's a simple exercise to show that this operator is well defined. That is, uh, it doesn't depend on the choice on, on, on the on the specific representation of little f in this in this form. It depends only on f. And also, it's a simple exercise which um, actually uses only the axioms of a spectral measure. Uh, that respective map, i.e., from the algebra of simple functions to be of H e is a star representation. So it is linear and um, respects the involution. And uh, in contrast to the usual Lebesgue integral, it is multiplicative. 
And this follows from the fact that the spectral measure is not fixed. So it is a star representation. I claim that it is bounded. Well, why is it so? If we take any simple function f, then the norm of the respective operator is uh, less than or equal to the maximum of the absolute values of ci's. This is again our proposition two. It follows from, from, from proposition two because uh, the projections e of ai are orthogonal to each other. But this maximum is nothing but the uh, supremum norm of our function f. And this holds for each simple function f. And now, since, um, since um, this inequality holds for each simple function, and since uh, simple functions form a dense star subalgebra in the algebra of, bounded, of all bounded measurable functions, we conclude that IE uniquely extends to a star representation, which will be denoted by the same symbol i.e. or the algebra of bounded measurable functions. This is, this is a usual extension by continuity theorem. So we have a bounded operator defined on a dense subspace and we extend it by continuity on the whole space. Okay, so uh, this uh, completes the construction of the integral. Um, also, we have to show uh, this formula. So let it be formula star. So this escalinear form associated to i e of f equals the integral of f with respect to the measure e u v. Uh, but it's immediate that this formula holds for uh, characteristic functions of measurable set simply by the definition of, um, of our uh, i.e. by linearity it extends to simple functions. So by construction construction formula star holds for each simple function f and by continuity it holds for each bound measurable function f. And this completes the proof. So in summary, we get uh, a one-to-one -one correspondence between uh, the set of finitely additive spectral measures on our sigma algebra A and the set of all uh, star representations of the algebra of bounded measurable functions. Well, this is a one-to-one -one correspondence. This is the meaning of our theorem. Okay, mm. and now let's apply this result to the Borel functional calculus. Um, let's recall that the Borel functional calculus, well, first of all, it's, it's a star representation of the algebra of bounded Borel functions. Uh, but we also know that this representation has the additional property of being continuous with respect to the weak measure topology and the weak operator topology. So now it's essential to ask, um, if we look at this correspondence, uh, which kind of spectral measures correspond to um, uh, um, this, uh, the, to correspond to representations which are continuous in this special sense? Okay, let's try to give an answer.
so from now on, we assume that X is a compact host door topological space. And we denote by B of X as usual the algebra of bounded Borel functions on X. And suppose that E is a finitely additive spectral measure on the sigma algebra of Borel subsets of X. By definition, we say that E is a regular if all the respective complex measures E, U, V are regular, that is, they are rubble measures on X. We now have the following result. This is our theorem two. I claim that E is regular in this sense, if and only if the respective integral IE is continuous with respect to the weak measure topology on B of X and the weak operator topology on B of H. So this is exactly our continuity property of the Borel functional calculus. Um, okay, so let's start with, with the uh, left to right implication. We well, assume that E is regular and we, we're trying to show that I e is continuous in this sense. So we take any bounded Borel function f on x, we apply our operator i e of f, and we calculate the seminorm, one of the seminorms, which determine the weak operator topology on b of h. So this is the absolute value of the following inner product. Okay, but we already know from theorem one that this is um, the absolute value of the following integral. And by assumption of the measure EUV is regular, it is a radon measure. So this expression is uh, actually one of the seminorms which determine the weak measure topology on BLX. Namely, this is the seminorm, which corresponds to the measure E U V. And if we combine this, uh, these equalities with, with our general continuity criterion for linear operators between local convex spaces, we conclude that I E is continuous in our sense. Okay, so this, uh, this um, shows that uh, this proves the left to right implication in our theorem. Okay, conversely, we now assume that uh, I E is continuous and we have to show that E is regular. Uh, so we take any pair of vectors, U and V and H, and we have to show that EUV is uh, a radon measure. So what is a radon measure? First of all, we have to show that it is sigma additive. And second, we have to show that it is regular. Uh, okay, let's start with the sigma additivity. Sigma additivity of EUV. Uh, 
suppose that we have mm, an increasing chain of Borel sets B1, B2, and so on. And let B denote their union. Uh, then it, it's, a, it's a simple exercise to show that the characteristic functions of Bn converge to the characteristic function of B in the weak measure topology. And now, since our homomorphism IE is continuous uh, with respect to this topology, we include that E of Bn converges to E of B in the weak operator topology. And if we now uh, calculate our seminars for, for, for this sequence, we conclude that um, mm, we conclude that um, the measures EUV, the measure EUV of BM converges to the measure E u b of b which implies that e u v is sigma additive so the property that we have just proved is actually equivalent to the sigma additivity okay uh, now we have to show the irregularity of this measure Um, okay, let's write once again uh, the continuity um, of um, IE in terms of the seminars. Um, so um, we see that there exist um, finitely many measures, rubble measures mu1 to mu n on x. And there exists a constant c uh, such that for each bounded Borel function f on x, the following inequality holds. Okay, so this is um, this inequality is equivalent to the continuity of IE in our topologies. Uh, let's now substitute here the characteristic function of any Borel subset. So this implies that for each Borel set B, um, E U V of B, the absolute value of E U V of B is less than or equal to C multiplied by um, the maximum of the absolute values of mu i of B. So this follows from the previous formula where we take F. Um, we, uh, so now, now our f, f is the characteristic function of b. And this can be estimated as follows. This is less than or equal to c mu of b, where mu is the sum of the variations of the measures mu i. Okay, now each measure mu i is regular. So the variation of each measure mu i is also regular. So this implies that mu is regular. Mu is a positive rubble measure on x. And uv is uh, dominated by mu. 
So now it's easy, it, it easily follows from the definition of the variation that if a complex measure is dominated by a regular measure, then it is also regular. Uh, this completes the proof. Uh, so we see that um, if we come back to our previous result, we see that um, regular spectral measures bijectively correspond to those representations of B of X, uh, which are uh, continuous with respect to the weak measure topology and the weak operator topology. By the way, mm, simple remark. Uh, it easily falls from our proof that each complex measure E U V is sigma additive. If and only if the respective spectral measure E is sigma additive in the weak operator topology. This easily follows from the proof of our result. Actually, um, this is the argument which shows this equivalence. And by the way, it's uh, a simple but useful exercise to show that this is equivalent to the strong operator topology continuity. Is con sigma additive in the strong operator topology. Okay. Okay, now we can, we can combine our results, theorem one and theorem two, and to get uh, our final form of the spectral theorem, both for star representations and for normal operators. Uh, this is our theorem three. Suppose that X is a compact Hausdorff topological space. And suppose that pi is a star representation of a star representation of the algebra of bounded, uh, sorry, of the algebra of continuous functions on X. A star representation of the algebra of continuous functions on X. Then there exists a unique regular spectral measure on X uh, such that pi is given by the integral with respect to this measure. Moreover, in this case, um, the same formula holds actually for each bounded Borel function on X. If we extend our representation phi in a canonical way to the algebra of, uh, to the algebra of bounded Borel functions. This pi tilde of f is the integral of f, and this holds for each bounded Borel function f on x. The proof is actually a combination of our previous results. We define the spectral measure E by the following formula. And now theorem one implies that the integral with respect to the spectral measure 
is nothing but our uh, initial representation pi tilde, that is the canonical accession of pi to the other row bounded Borel functions. Uh, so this formula holds. Uh, the regularity of E follows from theorem two. Theorem two implies the regularity of E. And finally, the uniqueness the uniqueness of E follows from the fact that uh, we have a one-to-one -one correspondence between pi and pi tilde. Uh, well, we know that uh, E is uniquely determined by pi tilde and we know that pi tilde is uniquely determined by pi. So as a result, E is uniquely determined by pi. Uh, this completes the proof. And as a special case, we obtain uh, the following result on linear operators, this is theorem four, and this is our third form of the spectral theorem. Suppose that T is a bounded normal operator on a Hilbert space H. Uh, then there exists a unique regular spectral matter E on uh, the spectrum of T such that the following formula holds. And moreover, in this case, we have the full and explicit formula for the Borel functional calculus. For each bounded Borel function f on the spectrum, the operator f of t is nothing but the integral of f with respect to the spectral matter E. Well, this is actually a special case of theorem three. So to get this result, we apply theorem three to the continuous functional calculus of our operator. And this immediately gives us the uh, existence uh, and uh, the existence of such a measure and um, the last formula. So f of t is this integral. And the uniqueness of such a measure is again immediate from the fact that um, the correspondence between normal operators and uh, representations of the algebra of continuous functions uh, on a suitable compact subset of the complex plane is bijective. Um, this form of the spectral theorem uh, may seem a little bit uh, exotic uh, at the first glance because it involves um, spectral measures which are quite abstract objects. Um, in fact, this is not um, exactly the case. In fact, this, um, this statement is uh, very close to the Borel functional calculus. Well, indeed, because if we have uh, such a spectral measure E, then we can, we can define the Borel functional calculus by uh, this formula. And conversely, if we have a Borel functional calculus, so remark, if we have a Borel functional calculus, then we can define this measure E of B by the following simple formula. So we see that this statement of the spectral theorem is very close uh, to the statement in terms of the Borel functional calculus. 
By the way, let's introduce some um, standard terminology. Uh, the above formula was denoted by star. Uh, this formula is called the spectral decomposition of our operator T. And the respective projections E of B where B runs over the Borel sigma algebra of the spectrum of T. Uh, these projections are called the spectral projections of T. Or the spectral projections. of T. Okay, um, in conclusion, let's uh, summarize uh, uh, what we already know about um, the spectral theorem. So a brief summary. So different forms of the spectral theorem, uh, except for the probably uh, for, for, for the uh, functional calculus, uh, sorry, for a functional model uh, theorem, uh, can be um, described on the following picture. So let's consider the set of all bounded normal operators on the Hilbert space H, such that the spectrum of T is contained in X, where X is a compact subset of the complex plane. First of all, we have a one-to-one -one correspondence between the set and the set of all star representations of the algebra of continuous functions on X. Now, this correspondence is given by the continuous functional calculus and it holds for each uh, compact subset X of the complex plane. Uh, next, we have a one-to-one -one correspondence between uh, this set, the set of all star representations of C of X and the set of all uh, star representations of B of X of the algebra of bounded Borel functions, which are continuous in the following sense. And this uh, bijection holds uh, for an arbitrary compact Hausdorff topological space X. And finally, uh, we have a one-to-one -one correspondence between this set and the set of all regular spectral measures. On the Borel sigma algebra of X. And again, this bijection holds for each compact Hausdorff topological space X. Uh, the uh, functional, fun functional model theorem is not on this picture. <clears throat> and the reason is that the functional model is not canonical. There are many different uh, functional models which correspond to the same operator. <clears throat> and finally, uh, um, mm, let me give you some more information without proof. Actually, it turns out that each <coughs> normal operator on the Hilbert space has a canonical functional model. 
but the uh, construction and the definition of this functional model involves the notion of a measurable Hilbert bundle. Um, so I have not defined this uh, notion in, in our course, but nevertheless, let me give you a statement. Maybe this will, will be um, useful for some of you. Uh, so this notion of a, Hilbert, of a measurable Hilbert bundle enables us to give um, another form of the spectral theorem, uh, which is probably the best form of the spectral theorem, uh, because uh, it gives us uh, actually complete classification of normal operators in reasonable terms. This is spectral theorem for uh, suppose that T is a normal operator on a separable Hilbert space. T is normal and H is separable. It's essential here. Uh, then there exists a measurable Hilbert bundle, an object which I have not defined. Measurable Hilbert bundle, say script H, over the spectrum of T. And there exists a positive problem measure mu on the spectrum, sorry, on the spectrum of T. Uh, such that our operator T is unitarily equivalent uh, to the multiplication operator MT, which acts on the space of uh, square integrable sections of this bundle. which is denoted by gamma two of H mu. And this operator acts as the multiplication by the coordinate. So if Fs is a section for a bundle, then the operator acts by the following simple formula. By the way, in particular, if um, we know that our operator is a star cyclic, uh, then it turns out that the bundle is uh, trivial and one dimensional. So gamma two is the usual L2 space and we get um, the functional model of a star cyclic normal, normal operator, which was constructed at the previous lecture. But in the general case, H uh, is, uh, can be more complicated. And this theorem also gives us um, a, um, a classification of normal operators up to unitary equivalence. Namely, if we have two such operators, say T and T prime, then they are unitarily equivalent. If and only if, uh, first of all, their spectra are the same, they have the same spectrum. Uh, second, the, the respective measures mu and mu prime are equivalent in the redon nicodem sense. That is, they are absolutely continuous with respect to each other. And finally, um, the dimensions of the fibers of our bundles are the same almost everywhere on the spectrum. By the way, the dimension of, the, of H lambda is called the multiplicity function of the operator. So two operators are unitarily equivalent, even only if they have the same spectrum, uh, the respective measures mu and mu prime are equivalent, and the, the multiplicity functions are the same almost everywhere. And this is probably the best form of the spectral theorem. 
And that's all I wanted to tell you today. Thank you very much. Um, and um, as for the exam, uh, I will send you the, the precise information in a couple of days.